Hi guys, and welcome to the second episode of the Stellar Saturday Conversations, a series where we talk to guests from all different areas of expertise in the world of digital marketing. I'm super excited to introduce you guys to this week's guest, John Liu. John got his start in search marketing over a decade ago at Overdrive Interactive, where he managed paid search and SEO for a variety of clients, including John Hancock, Harley Davidson, and The Dow. After Overdrive, John spent a little over five years at Blitz, an agency where he was the director of search and analytics, where he oversaw all SEO, paid search, paid media, and web analytics for all Blitz clients, including Vizio, Sony PlayStation, Tom's, Primrose Schools, and the UCLA Anderson School of Business, among many others. After, John served as the director of search and analytics at at Lucent, and then John served as the growth lead of North America at Riot Games, mainly known as the company that makes League of Legends for all you esports people out there. Currently, John is the director of growth at a young startup, and in this conversation, John and I use his expertise in search as a jumping off point for talking about overall marketing strategy and how that fits into a larger business plan. We also talk about where search fits into a larger marketing strategy, and then we go into some really specific, actionable things you guys can do to improve your search marketing. So without further ado, let's get into the show and hope you guys enjoy. All right. Uh, we're here with John. Uh, thanks so much for doing the podcast. I uh, appreciate you taking the time, man. Yeah, absolutely. Happy to. Yeah. So I guess we could uh, just go right into it and, and talk about, you know, when you and I met last week and uh, I kind of wanted to talk about a little bit of search and, and whatnot. Um, you did a really good job of, of saying, hey, let's take a step back and talk about um, how to search or something, uh, any channel fit into a, a marketing strategy as a whole. So mm-hmm. could you give some of your thoughts on um, uh, like frameworks or, or strategies that, that uh, you use? Sure. Yeah, you know, uh, if you think about it, marketing, or at least smart marketing, is really all about uh, kind of reaching your consumers with the right message at the right time. You know, when people decide to purchase a product or, you know, engage in a service or, you know, become your customer, the, you know, it's usually the end of a, you know, long and complex shopping journey. Um, sometimes it's a little shorter depending on like exactly what the product is. But for the most part, uh, there's a lot of things that go into the final decision to become your customer. And what we see that search marketing and just like any other channel is really powerful at specific steps along that journey, right? People choose to engage in specific channels or habitually engage with specific channels throughout the course of their lives, throughout the course of their shopping journey and shopping decision and shopping process. And they're looking for different information uh, or maybe most receptive to different information at different points of that journey. So if you can line up the information that people need with the right moment in their journey and the right channel where they're looking for that info or receptive to it, that's where you can really deliver powerful marketing instead of just kind of you know, the old style uh, of broadcasting a single generic message that all of your customers might appreciate to them anywhere where they might be. And just kind of like hoping that, you know, they'll remember that message at the right time. You just happen to hit them at the right moment, especially in the modern age where we're all digitally connected and everything's so measurable and targetable and you have a lot less digital privacy than you might expect. Um, You know, really hitting people with the right message at the right time and having that be part of an integrated communication strategy uh, is really how you develop uh, success, especially for, you know, uh, more complex products. Right. And I think that's one of the, the things that that really uh, struck me when we had our conversation was just that right message to the right person at the right time. Like mm-hmm. that was like golden to me. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, could you talk about um, kind of understanding Another thing that we talked about was how a marketing strategy should fit into a larger business uh, Mm -hmm. plan or a result. Yeah. So at the end of the day, right, your marketing strategy is part of what you're doing to make your business successful. And what that means is that you need to make sure that your marketing is hitting your pain points and that you're investing your time and your company's time and resources into things that are going to drive your business objectives and increase the overall health of your business which may be marketing in different forms or maybe other activities and maybe search and maybe something else. So you really have to understand, right, if the goal of marketing is to deliver the right message to the right person at the right time, well, what is that message? Who is that person? What is the right time? What is the right channel to do that? And, you know, does that even make sense in terms of the larger priorities of the company? 
you know, uh, for example, it doesn't make sense to spend a lot of time in your marketing strategy if your product sucks, right? If nobody would actually want your product, then you should maybe spend more time fixing that before you spend a lot of time uh, refining your marketing strategy. Although certainly thinking about your marketing strategy can help you understand who those target consumers are and, you know, what do they really want out of your product? Uh, how do you fix your product and make it better? It depends on who you're trying to make it better for. So the integrated marketing and business strategy where you're really trying to understand who are my customers, what is the value of my product, why should they buy the product, is this like big enough for this to be a successful business, and really kind of balancing those factors, right? That's at the core of what it means to run a good business and or be a successful uh, entrepreneur. And, uh, you know, having your marketing strategy ladder up to those goals and prioritized appropriately is what you need to do in order to achieve success. So it's about understanding how your immediate marketing objective, the thing that you're using as a KPI to understand if your marketing is doing well, how does that relate to your actual business objectives and make sure that those are appropriately aligned and then making sure that you know, you're balancing your investments appropriately because in general, um, you're not gonna have enough time and money to do everything perfectly, right? Uh, so you have to decide, what am I going to try to do as perfectly as possible that's gonna have the best impact on you know, the overall business situation? as opposed to what's something where I just need kind of, uh, you know, table stakes. Right. Yeah. I think that's, that's, that's a great point. And then, uh, we kind of, we talked about yesterday, where does, uh, you think, where do you think search in the mm -hmm. current day, 2019 fit into a, a marketing plan? Right. Cause there are like different mm -hmm. points that you explained. Um, so if you could just like touch on those. Yeah. And, uh, I think search is really interesting, especially because of how it's evolved over time, you know, um, I think, you know, especially in the early days of search, like uh, late, two, late, late 90s, early 2000s, uh, pre-mobile, uh, search was something that was not a habit for most people, right? Well, we, we, you, you know, your habits for like how you would do research or how you would try to answer questions probably didn't involve or start from search, right? You would maybe go to the library, you call information, you talk to your friends, you think about advertisements that you've seen, maybe you do some, you know, other research. Uh, and then as search became like more and more popular, what people would do, right, is that, you know, they would get into the mode where it's like, okay, I'm going to like sit down on the computer and do research. And what would happen is that search would very often especially be at kind of the very end of the shopping journey. And that was also, you know, at a time where the existence of search coming into being really created a unique marketing opportunity that had barely existed previously, right? Um, historically, Direct marketing was not really able to access people at, you know, what Google calls the zero moment of truth, which is kind of like the moment in which someone has made a decision to buy something and is now simply looking for like the correct vendor, the correct retailer to actually complete their transaction. A lot of search, especially in the early days, was very transactional and what I would say is navigational, right? People had kind of made a decision of what they were trying to accomplish and search was the channel that they were using to, at the end of their journey, to facilitate that, where you would search for a specific product or you'd you know, search for a couple of final details and make your final decision on. And uh, yeah, it was, a, it was a way for marketers to bring a message to people at the moment that they were actively looking for that message, as opposed to just, you know, they were someone who might be receptive to the message. And obviously that's, you know, extremely powerful, especially at that final moment when you're trying to make a decision to make a purchase. But then, you know, over the next 20 years, um, especially with the mobile revolution, search became much more accessible, right? You didn't have to like go to a computer and dial in and, you know, go to the search engine and do a lot of searches. Uh, you could just pull your phone out of your pocket and search at any time that you had a question, that, uh, right? And also, the quality of search results got a lot better. Um, you know, Google's results evolved from just being kind of like 10 blue links to having all these different types of search results and not just ads, right? Uh, websites got better, the internet got bigger, and it became easier and easier to find the information that you were looking for. More and more quality information became accessible and search became a much more integrated habit of our lives and it became much more than just kind of what you did at the end of your shopping journey, right? Search is now what we turn to at any moment when we have any sort of question. And as a result, you know, also because so much more searching is conversational, so much more searching is like on the fly or even through voice search as voice assistants continue to rise. Um, the types of queries have gotten way more diverse. 
Uh, there's a lot more upper funnel, research-based, general interest-based queries. Many search uh, kind of search intents, needs in search are satisfied on the search results page directly without needing to click through. So it's a much more complex environment than it was, you know, 10, 15 years ago, where it was very much, you know, you could really get a lot of value out of search just purely through kind of ROI driven bottom funnel marketing, especially if you were like a retailer or e-commerce kind of uh, company, right? But today, uh, because the variety of search has gotten bigger uh, and the variety of search intent has gotten bigger, one, uh, searches that used to kind of strongly indicate an immediate intent to do something are less likely to kind of as strongly indicate that intent, right? Because people are searching more often at all phases of their journey. So just because someone is searching uh, for a keyword that like had a really high conversion rate 10 years ago, doesn't mean that's how it works today. At the same time, it also means there's much more opportunity to kind of drive awareness and interest in your product through search than there used to be. But search is still a very high cost per click, especially paid search is a very high cost per click endeavor. So again, it's really about kind of understanding the role that search plays in the customer shopping journey, understanding the value that it can drive for your business at different phases of that journey, and then kind of building the correct search plan for your business across organic, paid, uh, and you know the different phases. Yeah, so um, I guess a good question to ask would be, um, as, as your career has progressed and you've seen these different phases of search, right? Mm -hmm. What are some strategies that you have implemented more recently that you didn't have to think about you know, 10 years ago, 20 years ago? And then what are those strategies that worked maybe 10, 20 years ago that aren't as effective now? Yeah, you know, part of it is also just the platforms that you can use. Google mm -hmm. kind of gives you uh, more options in some ways, but many less options in some other ways than years ago. The biggest thing, right, is just this whole idea of kind of understanding how search fits into the overall shopping journey as part of an integrated <coughs> marketing plan. Because that's really how you have to do it to get like kind of uh, really strong success outside of a, a few specific types of businesses or verticals. And then also kind of um, not just the necess necessity of doing that, but also the opportunity to do that, right? Hmm. Uh, with all of kind of the retargeting uh, options available today, with all of the audience data available today, right? In the Again, in the last 10, 15 years, digital media buying especially has undergone a real revolution where today much more than ever and you know I've been saying this for 10 years but it becomes more true every year you're trying to buy like individual people based on behavior rather than simply uh, kind of putting your ad up somewhere where you think a lot of those people might be right you're really focusing on people based on their individual behaviors trying to buy individual profiles um, and you have a lot more opportunity to do that. So for example, right, like 10 years ago, you could have had a, a very high funnel, very early on categorical search, right? Like let's say, you know, your business is, uh, your preschool, uh, your preschool, right? Mm -hmm. You have a lot of, uh, preschool locations and you're trying to get people to come in and bring your, their kids there. And you might have found that like the keyword daycare was a little too broad in general. Mm -hmm. Uh, people searching for daycare, Many of them are not thinking about, you know, an expensive preschool. Right. They just want someone to watch the kids and make sure they're not going to get in trouble. Uh, there is going to be a lot of people who do want that preschool, who want like, you know, small class sizes and educational curriculum, who just think about it in terms of daycare. They, you know, they're not thinking about it in terms of the word preschool. Ten years ago, it would have been very difficult to try to target and reach those people in search. You know, the, the, that they would have been overwhelmed by the larger number of people typing daycare into Google who were not looking for your premium product. Mm -hmm. Today, you have so many more options in terms of retargeting, lookalike targeting, similar audiences, audience-based uh, targets, ways to overlap the uh, kind of different campaigns and have uh, kind of cascading campaigns that feed into each other um, that you now really can kind of identify people doing this general search that have a more specific need, and now you're able mm -hmm. to target them using this kind of broad keyword uh, at a much more efficient and targeted way than you used to be able to. And that's completely changed kind of like how you need to be thinking about keyword research and how you need to be thinking about executing your paid search campaigns because you know the keyword is no longer like the only or the predominant form of targeting. Today, mm -hmm. it's actually much more about user profile, audiences, and, you know, very black box, a lot of how Google 
uh, has used machine learning to try to anticipate what people want to do. Right. Now that's that's great stuff. And I think um, maybe one thing just to kind of segue into it is how do you do keyword selection, right? And I think this was kind of like a, a big eye opener to me. Mm-hmm. Instead of you know choosing the keyword with the most searches, like again that very uh, targeted intent. If you could uh, talk about that a little more. Yeah. So, you know, when we talk about search marketing, it all comes back to keywords because what you're doing, right, the, the core value of search marketing is the opportunity to reach someone at the moment that they're making a proactive decision to ask a question. Uh, they're going to a search engine, they're typing in their question and looking for info about that subject, and you have the opportunity to appear in front of them exactly then. So if you think about that and then you think about, okay, so then, you know, Google uh, or Yahoo, but really it's Google, right? right. Uh, <laughs> You know, if uh, who what do they want to do? What's their objective in satisfying their customer, who's the searcher, right? Because their customer is the searcher. It's not you, the publisher, advertiser, or whatever. What they want to do is kind of give them the results that they're looking for, the best answer to their question on the internet, and then to some extent, maybe like the the answers that they were expecting, right? And then you have to ask yourself, so what is you know the best que- answer to this question that someone could potentially be asking? And how do I become that best answer? Or Mm -hmm. do I have the opportunity to become that best answer, right? So, and especially, you know, over the years, as Google has continued to improve the quality of search results, what they found, right, is that major brands tend to have results that people want. They tend to either just be actually higher quality, or at least people have more faith and trust in them, and it's the results that people are looking for. So over time, SEO has... Uh, results have swung more and more strongly towards major brands, especially for like kind of very general searches. Mm -hmm. So you really have to think about, you know, how do I occupy a niche in search where I truly am the best answer for this question? What are those questions that people are asking that I am the best answer for or that I can become the best answer for. Mm-hmm. And then making sure that you kind of balance that relevance and authority that you have with the value to you of, you know, are there enough people with this need that it makes sense for me to invest in being the best answer for this question? Right. Um, yeah, I think that, that that's also an interesting question of um, one thing that, that you just said was identifying a niche, right? And how can you be the best answer um, for that niche? Um, so my question is like, if you were going from zero to a thousand, right. And then a thousand to 10,000, et cetera. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, do you, how specific should you start or what's kind of like that framework of getting from like, you know, like what we Mm -hmm. talked about, like this productivity blog or whatever, how do I get from zero to a thousand readers, um, or traffic and then from, you know, different uh, orders of magnitude. Mm Mm-hmm. So you have to think about, right, like what could someone potentially be typing into Google to find you? Mm -hmm. And if we take a step back, right, like uh, earlier I was kind of talking about uh, transactional or navigational search. Right. The other side to that is kind of uh, uh, research-based search, informational search, Mm -hmm. right? So predominantly when people type in a question into Google, they have, you know, they're either looking for kind of navigational information where they know what they're doing and they're just trying Mm -hmm. to get to the page. They're just trying to do that as conveniently and easy as possible. Right. Or they're doing a more of a, an informational search where they don't know what they're looking for, right? They're, they're looking for answers. They're, they're looking for information that they don't already have. So if you think about your, then your website, you have to understand, you know, what are the searches for which it makes sense for me to kind of target being the best answer for an informational search? And then what are the searches I should expect that are of a more navigational form, right? Where someone already kind of knows that my content exists. Mm -hmm. They've heard of my site. They've heard of my blog. They've heard of my brand. They've heard of this specific Mm -hmm. article. And they're just trying to find it, right? right? So, you know, when we talk about, like, how do companies start out in SEO, this is where, you know, you have to really be very focused on having extremely strong navigational search from the beginning, Right. People have to be able to find you if they're looking for you. This is where Mm -hmm. nobody can slack off an SEO from day one, where you need to make sure that if someone is already aware of you, that they're searching for your business by name, that they are going to find your site. They're going to find your page. They're going to find the content that most uh, directly is valuable to them. 
Right. Nobody can ever like kind of ignore that. And a lot of the foundation of navigational search and SEO is really strong technical SEO, right? It's about making mm-hmm. sure that your site's well coded, that it's uh, you know put together in a way where Google can easily discover the site, discover all the content in the site, understand how it's interrelated, understand mm-hmm. what's most important. And uh, frankly, this is what a lot of SEO is at large brands and companies, where you know, through other marketing or whatever, they've established that industry leadership. They've established that strength, right? Right. Uh, People are already looking for them. When people see them in the list, they're naturally gravitating towards them. So for a lot of these businesses, Uh it's the the key in SEO is technical SEO that allows navigational searches to be successful and drive people to like the correct content for their phase of the shopping journey. Right. But, But then... The other flip side of right is kind of satisfying that informational need mm-hmm. where, you know, people haven't heard of you. They're not looking for your content mm-hmm. specifically. They're looking for more general content. They're looking for an answer. And your job now is to try to make your content the best answer to that on the Internet. And that's where, right, that, that takes a lot of effort. <laughs> right. Uh, so you have to kind of carefully prioritize. And this is where, you know, depending on your business, uh, it may or may not make sense to invest a lot at that specific moment right yeah so yeah i guess it's more contextual but kind of where you had my mind going was like if early stage you should really be focusing on uh more the navigational search Mm -hmm. and that's where people are already aware of you right and they're trying to look for they they already know about you and they're just looking for you on the internet Mm -hmm. essentially so it would be either it would probably be a little more wise (coughs) excuse me to try to get awareness of your initial brand on other maybe like Instagram or like Facebook or other platforms or other mediums to, to get that initial awareness. I guess that's like my question. So, yeah. you know, yeah. uh, just like almost everything in yeah. life, there's very few clear black and white right. answers that are true in all cases, right? So here, what you know, one of the most important considerations you want to think about is like, again, um, what do people, what is the need that I'm serving that people mm-hmm. might be typing into a search engine? And then right, how unique am I, right? Mm-hmm. Like, what is my unique selling proposition over potential other comparators? What are the needs I'm satisfying? Right. So there's a lot of businesses out there that are just trying to do what someone else is already doing, but like better or in a specific way that's better mm-hmm. for some people. So this is where you have to, you know, like wh- where is what I, how is what I'm offering unique? Why is this the best answer? And if you can identify that niche that already has a significant amount of volume, right? Mm-hmm. If, you've, if you've identified a consumer need that people are already researching that there's no good answers to, then you can immediately become the best answer in that space. And you should go ahead and immediately invest in like everything, right? right. You should, because you, you have the best answer to a question that people are asking. But for many businesses, especially early on, you haven't gotten there yet, right? You have a, a product that's comparable to many other products. Mm-hmm. It's gonna be better for some people than others. You maybe haven't established this kind of like dominance within a niche or within right. you know, even a larger niche, right? And if there's not a specific thing that people care about that you're already the leader in, then you know you have to really look at what is the best way for me to invest my resources as a business. And very often, what you should be doing is generating more demand for the thing that you're unique at instead of helping those people with that demand discover you. So right. that's where you have to have a good understanding of your business and your marketplace. And, you know, how do you, you know, when we're trying to balance the equation of delivering the right message to the right person at the right time, do you need to be working on your message or you need to be finding those people? Right. That, that, that makes a lot of sense. So I, th- I know we just kind of talked a lot about how to go from like maybe zero to 1000 in the early days of your company. What if you're, um, you know, you have a little bit of traction mm-hmm. and you're just trying to get to that next order of magnitude. Maybe it's a thousand to a hundred thousand or a hundred thousand now to a million. Mm-hmm. Like what are those different hurdles that, uh, or different strategies that you should be thinking about, uh, when it comes to search and maybe even though your overall marketing, uh, your strategy. Mm-hmm. So again, right, it comes back to right, right message, right person, right time. It's uh, obviously when you already have a business with a customer base, that gives you much more to go off of than you know when you're like in early startup phases and mm-hmm. don't even have customers, right? Right. Once you actually have some customers, then you can kind of understand, okay, you know, 
why do these people, uh, why are they my customers? Mm -hmm. What is, what is the value I'm delivering that is really appealing to them? And sometimes, uh, that might not be what you think it is, right? Uh, you have, you have to really think about what's driving, uh, this purchase decision. Um, you know, a, a classic marketing quote, you know, that I shared with you last right. week that I, I remember you enjoyed, right? It's like, uh, and I'm paraphrasing this, but you know, nobody shopping for a drill wants a drill. They mm -hmm. all want a hole, right? right? So you have to understand, like, what is the thing that someone really wants? And then once you have, like, kind of a, a good understanding of that, then, you know, how do I communicate to them that I'm offering this? And if you already have customers, then you can understand, you know, what is making my current customers really happy? What is driving people away? What do people talk about when they review, review me or refer me? And that can help you with your product development. Right? And this is where, again, marketing strategy has to ladder up the business strategy where you should have some sense of like, okay, I found a niche where I'm being successful. Is that the target niche for my business? Is there enough customers with this need mm -hmm. that even makes sense for me to try to scale this or grow this? Or, you know, am I maybe kind of, um, you know, driving into a dead end, driving into a cul-de-sac and I need to kind of go back out and, you know, find other adjacent niches or adjust the product to expand it? Right. If you found that like, hey, you know, there's like a lot of people with this need and I'm satisfying it in a unique way. And I, if I could just, you know, gain more market share, then my business would grow healthily and hit my business goals. Then, yes, that's what you should be doing. Right. You should kind of understand. All right. I found like my place. What I need to do now is get out there and make sure that all of these people are aware mm -hmm. of my product. So I need to kind of understand how do people become aware of their need or how do people become aware of the products that fill the need? And I need to be in those places. Right. How do people make the decision in like the features that they're going to ultimately select or the brand that they're ultimately going to select? I need to be there at those places with that information. And then, you know, when people are finally ready to make the transaction where they're just doing a navigational search, my SEO, my paid marketing needs to be on point so that people can like with the minimum number of clicks, go ahead and make that purchase decision before they change their mind. Right. So... <clears throat> When you're then, you know, really understand like, yeah, this is that market, then you can just continue to create that content and iterate upon that. But you may also find that like, oh, you know, the people buying from me are maybe not the people I was expecting. The reason that they're buying from me is maybe not the reason I was expecting. You may need to pivot your product. You may need to develop a new product. You may just find that there's not enough audience for this and you should be doing something totally different or just you know, kind of branching off of it. So you, you need to understand, right? Like what is the message that people want to hear where you can figure out like the best way to deliver it. Right. That makes a lot of sense. Okay. I thought uh, we could kind of discuss this, this tweet thread that mm -hmm. we kind of shared earlier. And for uh, the listeners at home, I'm going to, I'm going to read it out and I just want to get your, your general thoughts on this. So a uh, little context is that uh, the tweet thread is between two very high profile Silicon Valley uh, venture capitalists. Mm -hmm. uh, one's name is Andrew Chen. Uh, I forgot what firm. Oh, he works at A16Z mm -hmm. uh, or Mark Andreessen's firm. And then uh, the other uh, person involved is Keith Raboy, founder of Square uh, or co-founder of Square, uh, works at Founders Fund, I believe. And essentially what Andrew uh, tweeted on September 3rd was, I'm not a fan of relying on SEO when you're a brand new startup. Unfortunately, it's just too slow. It takes time to build reputation, to build enough buzz to get meaningful traffic and a lot of effort to generate a ton of content. And then four days later, he quote tweeted that and said, uh, if you tweet anything negative about SEO, all the consultants come out to argue with you. But I stand by my point. <laughs> SEO shouldn't be the primary channel for a startup. It's something that kicks in a few years after you get paid viral, uh, unscalable channels to work first. And then Keith Raboy, uh, the, the kind of um, instigating person that he is, he, he tweeted, I disagree entirely. <laughs> and, and then, um, uh, you know, some people, you know, replied, uh, I'm with Andrew, uh, even though we've gotten SEO to work for us in incredible ways at this company, it took three plus years, most startups died by the time we got it to work. If you're going to go for it, you need a lot of runway or a solid interim plan. And then Keith Raboy uh, replied to that. Well, I've been involved in at least five to six multi-billion dollar companies predicated on SEO. Then Andrew said, uh, happy to debate this one. Uh, just saying it's too slow, has gotten harder, more competitive over time. So it's an awesome second channel. And then uh, he basically said, what are the examples? And then maybe 
you have a little bit of insight on why may, maybe these examples work and why he's biased. But he said, uh, yes, see Yelp, Quora, Reddit, and Script. Mm -hmm. So uh, those are the examples that he gave to kind of disprove this whole point that SEO doesn't work for a startup. But I'm, I'm like we talked about earlier, it's probably not black and white. There's a lot of gray area to this. So I'm just kind of interested to get your thoughts on that. Yeah, you know, I, I talked about this a little bit, right? Where, again, it's about understanding what is the niche that your business occupies, mm -hmm. right? Um, you know, one of the things that people talked about in that thread, which I, I, I took a look at, uh, kind of as you brought up, right? Like, uh, he listed some examples of startups that had seen success. And then people were like, well, you know, those are all the companies that, one, you know, came up like 10 years ago, not today. And then, two... Uh, they have a strong focus on delivering textual content, mm -hmm. right? right? Which is obviously very different than maybe a product or an app. Uh, and then, you know, going back to the other end, I would say, well, clearly, though, there are businesses, even today, that have a strong focus on SEO from the beginning and can become very successful quickly. And it goes back to what I was talking about, right? It's about understanding what questions are you the best answer for? Mm -hmm. If there is already a question that people are asking that you truly have a unique answer for, then hell yeah, you should invest in SEO from the beginning, mm -hmm. right? Because you're going to, that's a way for you to fulfill an immediate need that people are already researching. And if you can become successful there, you're going to hit that right away. And that need, you know, it, you just have to have the unique offering. It doesn't necessarily have to be um, like a necessarily uh, a very specific feature or something, right? It could be more general. If you look at some of the examples uh, that you brought up in terms of like Quora or Yelp, right? right? You know, what that was is it was just a way to find information that didn't used to exist on the internet. Right. Uh, but today, if you try to launch, you know, like comparators to those businesses, while well, there's already a dominant player, you're not necessarily bringing something new that people are already looking for and know that they need to be looking for. Uh, so that's where it would be very hard to become successful in SEO if you're trying to, you know, invade a niche that already has a market leader. Right. So obviously, uh, you know, we're more removed from the recent technological waves of, uh, you know, kind of hardware innovation that have mm -hmm. driven a lot of the new offerings, right? Like it's no longer Web 1.0 or Web 2.0, right? right? Uh, a lot of this stuff already exists. So... You know, that's where I'm very sympathetic to the idea that, yeah, uh, new businesses today, it's risky to put too many of your eggs in the SEO basket right. because, you know, some of the algorithm changes have made uh, successful brands a little more dominant. And it's there's a lot more content out there competing with you. There's a lot more offerings that already exist competing with you. So if you try to, you know, have an SEO strategy to launch your business the same way you did in 2009 – Unless you've really, you know, found something that uh, is occupying this niche that people already have a need for, but no business exists, it's going to be hard for you to be successful in SEO right away. And I certainly agree mm -hmm. that, you know, you, you don't want to put too many eggs in that basket. But on the other hand, as I mentioned earlier, um, it is not okay to not care about navigational search, right? right? You need an emphasis on navigational search. Uh, and then similarly, uh, you know, you need to be kind of planning for the future, right? You need to be thinking about, from a business strategy standpoint, what is my unique selling proposition? Who are my customers, customer segments? What makes sense to them? And if you build your marketing content around those segments and you know deliver specifically what they need that's different about your company to them, well, you're naturally creating like really good SEO content, mm -hmm. right? That has an audience in mind that's focused on the specific concerns that they have that, you know, hopefully uses the keywords that they're typing into Google and searching for. And that will allow you to kind of, you know, build your SEO strategy alongside your fundamental business strategy, right? Mm -hmm. uh, if you don't think about the SEO at all, if you don't think about search intent, if you don't think about keywords, then, you know, you're just going to probably... Uh, you know, have to redo some work down the line. Right. Whereas if you bake some of that thinking in from the beginning, you'll get better results. But should you put, you know, all your eggs into the SEO basket? Probably not unless you have that truly unique offering. Right. So I think that was a lot of uh, good, very good high level stuff, right? Mm -hmm. And 
like we kind of talk about it's like uh when people want to learn the specifics first it's kind of better to take a step back and under and understand what the end picture looks like or the overall overall strategy and get that solid foundation and then you can start to begin executing right Mm -hmm. uh but now that we kind of talked about that um i just wanted to kind of get your quick thoughts on now getting really into the nitty-gritty of search Mm -hmm. and you know you talked to me about like what the three pillars of search are Mm -hmm. and how you can become really good at uh, each of those three pillars to improve your your rankings and start getting more organic traffic, obviously. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, uh, you know, especially looking at SEO, right? Mm-hmm. Organic search. So the three core pillars of success in SEO are one, uh, discoverability. And th- this comes back to a lot of the technical SEO and navigational search that we were talking about. You want to make sure that <clears throat> people in search engines can find your site, can find the content on your site, and understand what's relatively important. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> The second is uh, just pure relevancy, right? Are you talking about the topics that people are looking for the answers to? Right. And, you know, the the strongest way to signal relevancy to a topic is to use the same language that other people are using around those topics. Mm -hmm. And this is where a lot of keyword research comes in, right? This is where you need to understand what are the things that people are searching for, what gets searched relatively more often, what's strongly relevant, and making sure that you're able to communicate to the search algorithm that your content is highly relevant to the question that you have in mind by you know using the keywords. Mm-hmm. And then finally, it's about authority, right? It's about making sure that like, yeah, anyone can go out there and say something about a topic. Why should we direct more people to this answer mm-hmm. rather than another? And the primary way in which Google understands authority today is uh, kind of uh, is basically mentions, right? Uh, it used to just be links, mm-hmm. but over time, uh, that's evolved and it's a combination of links and like brand mentions, right? So it's mm-hmm. how do people talk about you and do other people call you an expert, right? Like the way to understand if someone's right. an expert is to see if someone who el- uh, someone else you think is authoritative calls them an expert. Right. So those are the, the three fundamental pillars of SEO, right? It's about making sure that your site is, you know, technically compliant and navigationally discoverable. It's about making sure that it's relevant and has the content that people are looking for. And it's making sure that Google understands your authority, uh, that you have enough links or general brand presence that people are like, oh, yeah, you know, this is someone that we should be listening to. And brand presence, um, just to kind of dive deep a little bit deeper on that is so say you are um, like a startup or not a startup, just like a business in general. Mm -hmm. And then like Forbes, the New York Times, writes an article about you. They don't necessarily have to link to your site. I mean, that, that helps, I, I imagine, right? Yes. That's building backlinks. But even if throughout the article they, they write like how great your company is, like mm-hmm. you're saying that is um, also factored in nowadays in yes. addition to, to backlinks. Yeah, absolutely. Although, of course, again, right, it, uh, it all depends. It's all relative, right. right? It's about like how much do you stand out against the, uh, against the competition in this sub-niche? So, for example, right, let's say uh, you're a sneaker startup. Uh-huh. And you manage to get some really good press coverage and, you know, like New York Times or TechCrunch or wherever comes and writes a whole article about you and, you know, talk about you as a sneaker company. Right. That was some really good content, really valuable link uh, from a high authority site. But is that significant compared to the volume of sneaker content about Nike and the right. Adidas? Right. Like that's it's a drop in the bucket. So right. no, despite the fact that you got like a really powerful backlink and really authoritative content and something really great. I mean, obviously that's really strong for PR. I'm not saying, right. You no, know, like why would you turn down that article? But you shouldn't be like, Oh, this is gonna, this is going to be the answer for SEO. Right. right? Whereas uh, let's say, you know, it was something else and it was like, uh, Oh, you know, you're like the vendor that Nike hired <laughs> to do the self lacing sneakers for back to the future right. anniversary. Right. Okay. Now, this is where you have a niche, right? This is something Mm -hmm. where they're talking about you in relation to this technology or in relation to this product where there's not a huge volume of the same people talking about a different business in relation to this topic, right? So it's all relative. Uh, If you can get, you know, that kind of prominent brand mention in a niche that's specific to you, that's more valuable than a link for a topic where you are just, you know, one player among many and there are leaders that drown you out. Right. That's cool. And I think uh, maybe another question I have is, you know, my mind is a little more focused on content, right? Mm -hmm. Obviously, we're doing podcasts, making videos, uh, hopefully writing, starting to write blogs in the future. Mm -hmm. So um, 
just like out of curiosity from a search perspective, is there any type of content that tends to perform better or more visual or um, like if you have a video embedded in your in your website, right? Or audio embedded in your website, is Google able to 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 discover that content and then provide a uh, search and then you know provide people search results based on that content or is text still kind of like the the main way to go? Yeah, uh, all of those things are true, right? So mm-hmm. if you go watch any YouTube video, you'll right. see Google has automated captions. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you use, you know, if you go to image search, you can now search an image in image search to get more images that look like that image or try right. to find the website that that image appeared on, right? So clearly Google has made dramatic advancements in their ability to understand images, to understand sound, to understand video. Uh, Google's way better at absorbing that, that video content and un, you know finding mm-hmm. its relevancy and authority than it used to be. But better doesn't mean perfect. Right. Right? At the end of the day, the algorithm, computers work more on text than anything else. Right. right. So uh, you know, it's, again, right? If you are the clear leader in a small niche, right? Then yeah, probably that video or that infographic will do pretty well mm. because Google's a lot better at understanding it now, especially if it's good enough that you start getting some. Uh, 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 mentions, right? If people are talking about it, uh, people describe it, people, you know, Google understands what a thing is based on, you know, what the text around references to that is as well. Um, On the other hand, if you're in a more competitive category, if, uh, you know, there's some already content out there addressing this topic, maybe you have better content, but, you know, it's not unique, completely unique, and the only thing that answers this niche then you need to make it as easy as possible for Google to find that value. Right. For Google to be able to recognize that like, oh, there's like a unique slant on this or they're talking about it more specifically or you know, just making it easy for them to see that this is more relevant than something else. Mm-hmm. So you know, like 15 years ago, uh, doing just image or video content with no text would have been just like SEO suicide. Right. That is no longer true. But if you want to get the best results, you still need it. Ma- you still need to make it easy for Google to translate your content into text. Right. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. And then, uh, just more practical question, I guess is, uh, of, of course, it be it depends on the nature of a business, right? Um, but is there kind of general guidelines or frameworks that you use to know how much content you should be putting out on a weekly or a monthly basis, and then how much time you should be uh, spend promoting that content to try to get those brand mentions and try to get those backlinks uh, relative to the amount of time you spend actually creating the content. Yeah, I mean, uh, at the end of the day, right, that's going to be different for every campaign, right. every business, every vertical. Um, you could try to give some general rules of thumb that, but th- th- to be honest, those rules of thumb are like for average cases right. and tend to be like heavily often informed by like resources available rather than like what would actually be the most successful. Right. Um, so especially, you know, uh, if you're, if you're coming at this from the perspective of like an agency or, uh, you know, an investor, Uh you probably have your hands in lots of different pots. Right. right? And, uh, you could come up with like a a standard approach that you apply. And if it works 70% of the time, you're probably doing really good. Mm -hmm, Mm hmm. But if you're the business owner, if you're the client and you have one business, right. uh, you know, you don't want to take the approach that works 70% of the time because you don't want to be in that 30%, right? Like right. you can't just move on to the next opportunity. So you really need to test and understand what works for you. And right, this comes back to when you're doing your campaign planning, understanding how your marketing plan ladders up into your business plan, how your campaign plan ladders up into your marketing plan. Why is this piece of content valuable to my business? Who is this intended for? How many of those people do I think are out there? Uh, what do I think it's worth it to me to get their attention? And then how does it actually play out? And you, you know, you actually have to like test and measure the ROI. Obviously, now also SEO takes some time to get rolling, mm-hmm. um, and you can't kind of like be like, oh, you know, my results in the first two weeks weren't worth it, so this wasn't good. Right. But this is where uh, you, you you need to have some sort of model for how uh, kind of initial success could project into long term success. Right. Or you have to have some idea of like, okay, 
this is how much I'm willing to invest in testing to determine if this is going to work out or not before I make a final call. Right. So for your business, again, right, you need to kind of go back and do some research into what are the unique niches where I have a unique selling proposition against other people who could be the answer on the internet. And what are those niches that are kind of like of the right size where I can create content that answers that question specifically and is unique compared to comparators. But at the same time, this is a common enough question uh, that sparks enough of a need that it actually gets like a good result back, right? From th the level of interest that it drives in the topic and the level of interest it drives in my business, in my brand, in my product. Right. And that's something you can only really do through testing. Right, right. Makes a lot of sense. Um, so I think we did a, a pretty good job of hitting on the current state of search and strategies that some people could, you know, start implementing. But I know you mentioned a little earlier about audio and kind of where the future of search is going. Mm -hmm. So um, how do marketers or, you know, people in general need to start thinking about what does audio mean? What, uh, what do all these like uh, future advancements in the world of search mean of how they have to restructure or rethink of their their search strategies in in particular. Yeah, this is a, this is actually a pretty meaty topic that we could get pretty deep into. But um, I will say a, a couple of things that really uh, spring to mind for me. Right. So earlier I mentioned how like the industry of search kind of really changed over the last fifteen years, and a big piece of that was, in my opinion, mm -hmm. the advent of mobile. Right. Suddenly everybody could search at any time out of their pocket instead of having to like go to a computer and search from a computer. This changed the phases of the shopping journey in which people were searching, as well as the you know keywords that they typed into search. Right. And I would say voice search is, a, is you know, a similar evolution, not, probably not as impactful because there's not as much adoption and it's not like so dramatically different from what was available to you before. But it's still, you know, what it is, is it's introducing um, one, people are now searching at different times, maybe, right? Like in different times in the shopping mm -hmm. journey, right? Mm -hmm. Right, right. Like uh, they're, they're, they're starting to search like with different needs in mind at that moment. And they're also changing you know, exactly what they're putting into the search engine uh, when they go ahead and make that search. So like, um, you know, one thing that you find, for example, is that like, uh, again, this is like a mobile local example, you know, in like the 2000s, when people searched geographically, they would most commonly type in like a zip code or the name of a city, mm -hmm. right? So if you were like, oh, uh, I want to find like uh, a really good shoe store in Torrance, you go and be like, shoe score torrents. Right. Uh, you know, today, people are much more likely to be like, shoe store near me, shoe store nearby. Right. Right. Because the mode of thinking in which that they're engaging in search has changed, the convenience has changed, and kind of like the expectation that your phone knows where you are has changed. Right. right? So now if you look at voice search, right, what's happening is that, you know, people, uh, because they're searching via voice, they're less likely to edit or revise their query before they go ahead and like hit enter. Right. Um, which means that you also tend to have like longer and less consistent queries, right? Like unique queries are rising in mm -hmm. number where fewer and fewer people search the exact same thing for the same question because they're kind of like thinking out loud as they construct their query, right? Right. And then people also tend to be like more likely to be searching on the go. They may be searching more often like in relation to uh, their current location, right? Uh, someone searching for a retailer may now be looking for physical location more often than we're looking for an e-commerce opportunity or vice versa. Right. So again, you know, depends on your business, but you should really be looking at what are the kinds of keywords that I'm getting traffic off of. Um, if you have a smart paid search strategy, you should have broad keyword campaigns mm -hmm. and search query reporting that allows you to kind of understand the diversity of different queries that people are driving to your site and understanding, you know, like what is the way in which people are engaging with my category and engaging with my brand in search and making sure that again, right, you're speaking the language of the customer, you're building content mm -hmm. or driving campaigns or bidding on keywords that are aligned with the way people are choosing to engage with your business in, in this channel. Right. That's all good stuff. Uh, I really like what you just hit on. Um, talking, answering the question or p making content in the way that people are talking about it. Mm -hmm. I think that's that's super powerful, man. 
and then if you if you want to think about that like in a tactical way of like how are you actually doing that in the context of search right it's it, it also dovetails in with this kind of general trend where google is just getting much better understanding what people mean right mm-hmm. and you know there's been this big trend kind of like from the idea of just keywords which are like very granular and unique mm-hmm. right to the idea of entities right there's multiple keywords that could be talking about the same topic and uh you know these are different shades of an entity instead of just like all individual granular keywords. Mm-hmm. And then as, you know, again, that keyword diversity grows as the way in which people search for the same topic becomes more diverse because the search engine is able to process more diverse queries mm-hmm. or because, you know, again, the mode in which people choose to engage in search has changed. That's where you need to kind of like, you need to even more double down on this concept of entity because it's less and less likely that an individual keyword that you've selected without entity thinking is going to be successful, right? Uh, And, you know, again, this is where (laughs) I think marketing is uh, going through a cycle, right? Where uh, for a time, there was this incredible rise in the power of like direct response, bottom funnel marketing, right? where, you know, you had these new unique opportunities to reach people at those phases of their shopping journey, et cetera. And, uh, you know, you were able to build these very powerful campaigns that just, you know, picked off at the bottom of the funnel. But as entity search becomes a bigger thing, as, you know, this diversity becomes a bigger thing, and as Google puts more emphasis on, like, larger brands, it's much more about, right, having search come in at those specific points in the shopping journey where you know people are using search and having that, you know, be explicitly designed to catch downstream activity that you are trying to create Mm -hmm. through other marketing campaigns. Right. Yeah. And, uh, I think that we hit a lot of good points on search and now just to kind of go back to where we started the conversation of, you know, one of the things that you explained to me was when you're, uh, I think one of the things we talked about, right. There's so much in the world of digital marketing, right. Mm -hmm. There's search and, and social and within social, there's all these different platforms and email and, Mm -hmm. and all these different things. And people talk a lot about the idea of being a quote-unquote T-shaped marketer, Mm -hmm. right? Um, But one takeaway that I had from our conversation last week was uh, telling me, of course, like, you have to become an executor, right? Mm -hmm. You have to become a a practitioner. Mm -hmm. But then how do you develop that uh, overall strategy thinking through the lens of a particular... uh, 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 domain of expertise, uh, expertise, right? So, how did you personally uh, kind of develop this overall uh, marketing strategy? Think the strategy thinking, while you obviously probably at the beginning of your career were more being more of an executor and, and actually in the in the weeds of this stuff. Mm-hmm. So, how how do you kind of develop that thinking? Yeah, I mean, uh, just like anybody else, it's a lot about the opportunities that come to you mm-hmm. and how you choose to think about them and how to, how do you choose to execute on them, right? So. When I started in marketing, uh, I started a search agency uh, doing paid search and SEO, very bottom funnel focus, very direct response focus, very immediate focus on like pure ROI and last click, last step of the journey ROI, right? Mm-hmm. And then just uh, over the course of working there, especially as like mobile came in and um, you know this, the rise of entity search became more important, you know, you really came to understand, right, that you had to do good marketing by you know, meeting, delivering the right message to the right person at the right time, Mm -hmm. understanding the motivation behind a search, right? Um, As search became much more and more competitive, you, it wasn't as easy to just build out like, oh, here's a, you know, back in like 2006, what you could do is you could build out a list of 200,000 super granular long tail keywords, many of which might get searched like 10 times a year. And you could bid like five cents on all of them. Right. And then uh, whenever someone typed in that hyper specific search, you would get your hyper specific ad and you know, it'd be great. That's exactly what people want to see. Well, Google was like, okay, uh, this doesn't work for us because we're getting these massive campaigns that cost us a lot of processing power to like, you know, run all these super granular settings. And we're not getting anything out of it because again, like this keyword is getting searched 10 times a year. Right. right? Like we're making 50 cents on this auction and we have to determine if the auction is going to run 3 billion times a year. How does that make sense? Right. So Google changed it, right? So that first you just couldn't really bid like five cents on things Mm -hmm. anymore. Then uh, they made it so that like uh, lower volume searches just aren't eligible to be in the auction until they hit like a certain volume. 
and all these things. So th- th- this granular ability to just do that went away at the same time that like consumer approach to search was getting more sophisticated and it was, you know, being built more into all phases of our shopping journey. So just, you know, through the nature of kind of like the, the levers available to you changing alongside consumer behavior changing as a marketer naturally had to evolve to better understand, you know, what is the intent behind a search? What searches are like a little up, more upper funnel that it makes sense perhaps uh, spend more focus on SEO as opposed to paying extremely expensive cost per clicks with a low conversion rate. And then naturally, um, you know, as I progressed in my career and kind of went to more agencies that worked on more than just search and saw kind of integrated full uh, campaigns. And as a consumer, I, you know, I, I would see like TV commercials and understand how that you know, could drive me to search in a certain way, which could then be fulfilled by a lower right. funnel search campaign specifically designed to kind of capture the activity driven by the upper funnel campaign. And then, um, you know, again, kind of thinking about like, you know, c- coming to the concept of uh, contact with this concept that, right, like nobody wants a drill, people want a hole, mm-hmm. right? Uh, and understanding what is the thing that people really want to buy and how do you communicate to that to them? How do you make them feel that? And then also, you know, um, as I worked on more products that had like more complex dropping journeys, right? Really kind of, um, there's, there's another great marketing quote, which is something like, uh, rational arguments cause decisions, whereas emotional arguments cause action. Right. right okay. Yeah. And then kind of understanding, okay, yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and I see yeah. that, right? Especially in more B2C. Like when you're making a B2B purchase, which is a, a lot of my early career was spent working on B2B companies. Right. Um, you know, unless you're an entrepreneur or the business owner, you're not spending your own money, right? Right. So it's it's less likely that you're going to be making kind of um, a very emotional purchase that you're right. personally attached to. Instead, you're probably kind of trying to make a defensible decision, right? Right. Where you have like an argument for like why I made the right choice if someone questions it later. Right. So that's where like you know, very rational arguments perform extremely well. Right. But when you get into like consumer marketing, um, then it's much more about like, how does something make you feel? Right. Right. How do you set expectations around a certain thing? I think like you explained that spectrum of emotion and function. Right. Right. Exactly. Like when you, when, when you have a business, you have to understand why are people buying my product? Is it because of functional reasons or mm-hmm. is it because of emotional reasons? And it's always on a spectrum, right? right. Like uh, there's very few products that are purely on one end or the other. So you have to kind of understand where you fall upon that and then tailor your marketing to kind of deliver and communicate the needs that are actually driving that purchase. Right. And uh, maybe, you know, if you, if you have time for a few more questions, um, one of the things that I, I, I think is interesting is how do you build a team, right? And in terms of building a team, like, of course, like culture and personality, that all has to fit. What are skill sets that you look for in someone in your position who's more of a, has a senior role, and and what are like skill sets that you look for uh, in people? Like how important are people who could create content versus mm-hmm. copywriters versus paid media people, analytics people? Like what is that? What does that perfect mix look like to you? Sure. Well, again, right? It's, it's, it's it all depends, right? right? It depends on your business, depends on your needs. Kind of finding that balance between emotional and functional. Mm-hmm. Um, you know. In general, though, you, you kind of do need all of that, which is why like agency as a business model exists, right? Many businesses, it doesn't make sense for you to hire all of these people and have them available to you, you know, 2000 hours a year. Uh, right. You just don't, you don't have enough of a demand for that, but you still want people who have like spent enough time doing these things to have the expertise and talent and experience to do the job that at the level that you need. So that's why, that's why agencies exist, right? Where right. You can, you can have people working on these things full time. Um, beyond the need that like one particular business might be able to support. Right. Uh, But yeah, you know, it's kind of like understanding, right? Like what's the business plan? Why do I think, you know, people would want to buy my product? What are the unique selling propositions? Are those more functional or emotional? What is the right time to get in front of someone for that? And then, you know, kind of building out your marketing strategy and team to communicate to your customers at the moments where it's most important to communicate to them. Right. That makes a lot of sense. Um, maybe one more question. Mm. How about, let's do a fun one. Do you have a favorite story or a favorite project that you worked on that, you know, you're obviously able to tell and, and what did you like about that project and, and what did you learn from it? 
in, in, in your career? Yeah. Uh, so I would say some of the work that I've done in my career that I was most proud of was a campaign for, I, I, I kind of like went to this well already, right? Mm-hmm. A campaign for a uh, premium local preschool franchise business. Mm-hmm. So they have like 300 plus locations in the United States, premium preschool with a educational curriculum, um, you know, designed to be like one of the most expensive preschool options in your area. But where, you know, if you sent your child there, you could feel really good that they would get ahead in life and, you know, be ahead for kindergarten and, you know, be on the path of success. Mm -hmm. And uh, I learned a lot from that project because it was one of the first truly like full funnel integrated projects where I got to work on, where we had a very clear understanding of kind of like different audience segments, right? Like not all of your customers are the same. The parent of a four-year-old looking for pre-K uh, has very different emotional and functional needs than the parent of a six-month-old who just needs to go back to work, right? right. The parent of that four-year-old, uh, they're much more concerned about, like, educational curriculum and making sure that my child is, like, ready for kindergarten, right? Whereas that parent of the six-month-old, for them, it's, like, a heartbreaking need to not be with their child all day every day and by far the number one most important thing is that you know your child is going to be well loved and cared for and will be happy and comfortable in this Mm -hmm. environment and you know do i really care if they're like teaching them and prepping them to learn how to read uh much less so right right so even understanding that like this you know same fundamental product has very different feature needs for different Mm -hmm. subsets of your customer base that was like, uh, you know, something that was, you know, you understand right. things intellectually, but then you have to really do something very often to kind of really grok it, to kind of understand it uh, deep in your heart to the point where it's obvious and can guide your instincts. Right. So, you know, taking a look at that and then, you know, understanding like, local versus national, mm-hmm. informational versus very bottom funnel. You know, we came into uh, a, a campaign where a lot of the calls to action were like, uh, you know, Sign up, uh, sign up, register, right. you know, like uh, put your deposit down, like, you know, become a customer of the school. Right. But then you realize, okay, you know, wh- what's the shopping journey? Let's look at the true shopping journey of the parent, right? Like there's a need that comes up that's either like I got to go back to work or, oh, I think, you know, like my neighbor's kids seem to be smarter than my kids or more right. ready for school than my kids. Um and then that leads into like, okay, I'm, I'm going to start doing a certain amount of research. I need to understand like what are the options available to me. And then what happens right at the very end, you know, there's like not really a lot of parents that will send your child, send their child to your school sight unseen. Right. They're going to come for a tour. Right. right? They're going to come right. and look at the place and talk to you. It's and a talk big to the decision. Teachers. It's a big deal. So does it make any sense for your advertising call to action to be, you know, sign up today, get a free week of preschool or whatever? Or is it come for a tour? Come meet us. Right. Come see that this is the place for your child. It's one of the analogies that I use is that you could you can know you're going to marry that girl that on the first date. That's your future wife. But you're probably not going to ask her to marry you. That's a big life decision. That's so right. kind of similar to this. Yeah. You, you need to go on a few dates first. Yeah. Right? You got to go on at least, a, you know, two or three. And then you can. No, I was kidding. Right? But yeah. So, you know, th- this was one of the kind of parts of my career where, again, like I, I had a very clear lesson that allowed me to not just intellectually understand but truly kind of instinctively understand that you need to you know have the correct kpis for your marketing campaigns and understand how those ladder up to the kpis for your marketing strategy and how that ladders up to the kpis for your business right so the ultimate kpi for the business is certainly enrollment and revenue which right. also come comes into like oh you want older kids more than you want younger kids because you can have you know fewer teachers for more students if they're four as opposed to if they're one right right Uh, But then also, you know, again, understanding, okay, yes, the enrollment and revenue is the business KPI, but the marketing KPI should actually be like tours, right? right? And then it's up to the, you know, kind of the the school director to teacher to be the salesperson that gets that final revenue conversion. Marketing is just bringing people in the door. So the correct marketing KPI is tours, not, you know, revenue and enrollments. Right. And then... If you look at individual campaigns, then, okay, yes, that bottom funnel search campaign should be measured directly on, like, cost per acquisition per school tour. But then perhaps, you know, this, like, uh, SEO campaign should be more measured by, like, uh, total volume of traffic to individual school pages that have their address and phone number and maybe, like, 
click through to map location or click through to call, right? right. That's a, a better measure for the success of like more mid funnel marketing than you know the actual form completion to get to sign up for a school tour. Right. And through you know kind of understanding of strategy, the expected actions that you want your customers to be taking throughout their shopping journey, as well as just like actual measurement and observation of what really happens. This is where right, you understand what are my can, can, campaign KPIs, how does that ladder up to my overall marketing KPIs, how does that ladder up to my overall business KPIs, and understand what's being successful, what's being truly successful, and you know how you can pivot to continue to get better results. Right. All right, yeah, um, yeah that was a lot of great information, and you know I hope the people at home or whoever is listening, you guys got a lot of value from this, and hopefully some tactical things that you could, you know, start implementing in your own search campaigns or your general marketing camp, you know, uh, marketing campaigns in general. And, um, I just want to say thank you, John, for taking the time out of your day, out of your uh, Saturday to record this and, uh, really appreciate it, man. Yeah, absolutely. It's uh, it's fun to talk about this stuff. I think it's really interesting, you know, cause at the end of the day, marketing is really just about like, how do you influence human behavior? Right. And right. then like good and ethical marketing is about how do you do that by delivering value to the consumer, right? You're not trying to trick people. You're trying to kind of like clearly and truthfully tell people that we have something that's going to make your life better in some way. Right. And if you can do that, like at the right moment at the right time and like a non-invasive way, then, um, that's creating a better world for all of us. Right. Uh, you know, it's, it's easy to kind of look at marketing and advertising and how it's proliferating and invading all the spaces and kind of the privacy concerns. And yeah, it's, it's definitely kind of, you know, it's, there's things about it that are like, what is the right balance for society? But fundamentally, it's really just about delivering value to people. And I think it's really fun to kind of think about the ways in which to do that. Right. I appreciate it. And uh, thank you so much for your time, man, again. And uh, we'll see you guys next time on the next episode of the Stellar Studio Sessions. Don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast wherever you get it. And I uh, hope to see you guys next time. Bye. Well, that just about does it for this episode of the Stellar Studio Sessions. Be sure to subscribe for more daily digital media insights, analyses, and opportunities. And don't forget to rate and review so we can bring you the best daily content possible. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you again tomorrow for another episode.